warm welcome to everyone. Um, I've got details of some upcoming talks after Amanda has uh, uh, given her presentation this evening. <clears throat> but it's my pleasure to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Amanda Bevan from the National Archives. And if you've got your screen configured like mine, Amanda is in the top left hand corner at the moment. So we're live, actually live from the National Archives and from the Friends Lounge, which I'd almost forgotten about. It's been so long since I've been to Q. But but anyway, warm well, welcome to Amanda. Uh, Amanda joined the then Public Record Office in 1979. So Amanda, I think you must be due for a blue plaque when you eventually oh move yes and, and move on. But uh, this evening, Amanda is uh, is going to talk to us about the Prize Papers, which is a, a project that's very close to our hearts because we've funded a number of these um, various projects over the years and the project as we're here this evening mm. has gone from strength to strength and is very absorbing and very fascinating. Um, as I said Amanda has been at the archives for a very 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 long time even mm. before the friends were thought of when we burst mm. into life in 1988 so I'm not sure if you if you can remember that uh, oh, yes. particular moment in history Amanda but I can but, but there we are good okay so uh, Amanda is um, <clears throat> ahead of the of the legal records and has been responsible for cataloging many 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 thousands of records and updating them and has recently moved into the area of the prize papers and I think we started being involved about five or six years ago. Mm. So <laughs> without further ado, Amanda, you're amongst friends. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. I hope I can be heard properly. I'm just going to share my screen. And there we go. Good. It's really, really nice to be asked by the friends to come and talk to you. I appreciate the invitation enormously. And I was very happy to discover that today, quite accidentally from my perspective, happens to be National Letter Writing Day. So I think this is a good time to talk about the written treasure found on captured ships, 1650 to 1815. When we're talking about captured ships here, we're talking about the ones which are captured by the British. Royal Navy or British privateers, uh, which were, which as they sound, they were private men of war out to make a profit, but they were commissioned by the Crown, and so it was all legal and above board. If you didn't have a commission, you were just a plain old pirate. So here we are, let's go out to sea. In the 14 wars between uh, about 1650 and about 1815, we took or captured over 350,000, no, 35,000 ships and our enemies took British ships. What we were doing was taking the ships which are known to be enemy ships or, no, or possibly neutral ships carrying enemy goods, basically anything that we could sweep up and then you would go to court and try and prove the enemy status. Because if you did, then you could take all the profit. Uh, the Crown took a bit of it, the Admiralty took a bit of it, but it, actually the majority of it went to the capitals. So it was quite a nice um, lucrative trade. All nations had, all nations, all seafaring nations, let's say, had naval, navy ships and privateers. Uh, they all used courts to prove the legality of their captures. The only thing that's really unusual about the English High Court of Admiralty Court is that we kept all the papers found on the ship, and that's what's now called the prize papers. Uh, so almost every ship had some ship's papers. I don't know if you can see up here, there's rather nice marbled covers, lots of writing. There's something we found many times a quill pen just stuck inside and we were rather amused to discover that somebody else had found a quill pen in a, in a record and a big fuss was made of it and uh, lots of tweeting about it and lots of discussion about it and we think we find them all the time but we find lots of things all the time that most people don't find in, in records here the latest thing was a cockroach which fortunately turned out not to be something that had crept in at the archives, but something which had jumped on board ship in West Africa in the 1740s and got squashed. However, what we're here to talk about today is the letters 
about 20% of the ships carried letters. We think as a guesstimate, it's probably about 160,000 letters and they're undescribed. We don't know who they're from, we don't know who they're to, we don't know where they were written or where they were sent or what they're about. And as you can imagine, that is a vast amount of material about everyday lives, which is just remaining there to be discovered. Uh, you can see how the prize papers were, were described, not very well described at all. You have the court records and capture records, which are done by ship. And for a long time, they were just described as A, B, C, D, E. We've now got almost all the wars described, at least by the name of the ship and the name of the captain of the ship. So you can, if you've got a bit of information, you can find them. Um, for some wars, we're actually doing a great deal more. Um, and I'll come on to that a bit later. However, the letters were boxed randomly in a series called HCA 30 Miscellanea. And it's one of those miscellaneous series which has descriptions of miscellaneous, various miscellaneous. But for the, for the papers, they're called things like Dutch, Spanish, French or various. And sometimes it's a complete fiction. So that you might get papers from a ship which is a French ship coming from a French colony to France, written in French uh, and described as Dutch. So it's a bit of a lucky dip, really. Um, Tony mentioned that we'd been, friends had been supporting the Prize Papers project uh, for about six years. In fact, it goes back just to 2013 when uh, the Friends commissioned an artist to make a series of films about them. Um, we had, we made these. One of them, the one called Without a Dollar in My Pocket, was shortlisted for quite a prestigious prize for research in, in uh, archives. And we, we were runners up on that. But it's a lovely film. And each of these three films are just about to be transferred to uh, YouTube, where you will be able to see them shortly, um, probably in about a month's time. They're quite entertaining. The Frolicsome Ditty is the one which has got music which hasn't been heard since 1745. Uh, the Friends have also published several good articles in Magna and we were just talking before the, the talk began about it would be good to make them more widely available. But more importantly than these things, the Friends have been incredibly supportive of the project over the whole of its existence. And we started out from such a low base with such poor descriptions and we're moving on to such, you know, so much better ones. And the friends have played a huge part in that. The other people who've played a huge part in it are our volunteers. And we have at least one in the audience and maybe more. And we have to pay an enormous tribute to the work that they do. They are invaluable. They also get very dirty working on it because these records are dirty. However, in 2018, we stepped up a bit. Um, the University of Oldenburg and Professor Dagmar Freist had been using the prize papers for about six years at that point, and they'd been working with us to try and get funding to really do something, particularly about the letters, to describe them so that anybody could use them, anybody could find them. It was no longer playing Lucky Dip that you could actually search for records, you, for, for letters, say, from, um, I don't know, Mauritius to France in a particular year and find them all. Or you could search for writers. Anyway, they've got funding from the German government to do a 20 year research and digitization project. It started in 2018. We had a bit of a lull last year, obviously. So things are running a little bit late. But in October or November this year, they're going to start putting up the first of the digitized material. They're creating a research database that goes with it. It's going to be free access. And I wish we had funding for 20 year projects in this country, but the funders who are doing it will not look at anything below a 20 year project. Anyway, let's get out to sea again. In 1665, two huge Dutch East Indiamen bound from Indonesia to Amsterdam were taken in fight by the Navy in the North Sea. Uh, Dutch East Indiamen are kind of like your prize, your, your absolute prize of prizes. Uh, the East India Company was the wealthiest corporation the world's ever seen. It was based in the East Indies in what's now Indonesia, in a place called Batavia, which is the Latin word for the Netherlands. Uh, it also had outposts in China and Japan. And these, uh, these Dutch East Indiamen were brought into Harwich of all places and then brought into the Thames. Uh, but unfortunately, the captors had got so excited that they'd done something dreadful called break bulk which is to loot the cargo. And Peeps here, must have Peeps in a story about of this kind, visited the captured ships. 
and he, he wrote ecstatically about the amount of just wealth on display. He said, the greatest wealth lies in confusion that a man can see in the world. Peppers scattered through every chink, you trod upon it, and in cloves and nutmegs I walked above the knees, whole rooms full of them, and silken bales and boxes of copper plate, copper plate, one of which I saw opened. Now, this was not supposed to happen, but it gives you an idea of just what people really wanted when they captured a ship. They wanted wealth, they wanted luxury goods, they wanted something that they could sell to advantage, but they would be quite happy to capture something much smaller because they could still sell it if they proved it as good prize. So we're going to jump forward a few years now to a particular ship, the Wappen van Horn, the Arms of Horn. It's another Dutch East India ship and it's uh, existing at a time of great difficulty and danger for the Dutch Republic. 1673 was the Dutch year of disaster. It's when half of the Netherlands was occupied by invading French troops. The Dutch responded by flooding the land to prevent the advance of the, of the French. They murdered their leader, Johan de Witt, in a particularly unpleasant way, and they turned to William, Orange, uh, William of Orange to create a better defence. It was also the height of the Little Ice Age, absolutely freezing, bitter, awful weather. Now the Wappen van Horn is coming up the English Channel, limping up the English Channel in really dire straits. In the last five weeks, really appalling weather. She had lost three of her four anchors, three full sets of sails and 40 of her crew out of 280. So she's in a poor way. She beat up the English Channel, past Chesil Beach, past the Isle of Portland, bound for home until nearing the Isle of Wight. She was taking on so much water that she just gave up. She was forced to turn for the nearest harbour. She had seven foot of water in the hold. And so running, turning back and running before the wind, she turned back to Portland, where the captain threw, uh, drew, what's the word? The captain drove her into land. He effectively ran her aground. He got, he got sheets of lead and clapped her papers between them, and threw them overboard. Fortunately for us, 120 of these letters were fished out of the sea, dried out and sent up to the High Court of Admiralty in London in order to prove who she was and what she was and why she was good, good prize. Now, can you see this letter here? It's, um, it's quite a typical Dutch letter for this period of time. It's a single sheet of paper. They make a fold down here in the first place and then use that as a margin to write against it. They always run out of space, so they write a bit more down here. And then they fold it in and you can see all the folds of it still and it folds up to a small little packet like that and you write the address on the outside. A very good Dutch historian called Judith Brouwer has written about them as evidence from the, um, the Dutch year of disaster. And what they show is letters from perfectly ordinary people, not rich people, working people. And they're writing out to uh, friends and family in Batavia. Now you'd think this was a ship coming back from Batavia, wouldn't you? Coming up the channel, coming home. But in fact, she was the ship, a ship which had gone north of that, around the north of Scotland, the way that the Armada had. And she'd run into, into this dreadful weather and just couldn't go any further. So she decided to come back home instead. Um, it's quite an interesting story about her. She wasn't full of treasure. She was taking bricks out to build a fort in Batavia. When she ran aground at Portland, there was a rumour that spread around the local villages that there was gold under the bricks and very many people came and took all the bricks out to find the gold, but there wasn't anything there. But anyway, we have our letters and here's one of them. A wife writing to her husband. Dear husband, it's hard to tell you exactly how unfair and unpleasant it is for me now that you've left again for the East Indies. No matter what, I miss your presence, which I'm longing for more than anything in the world. That would be quite a nice letter to receive. This is another one, another wife. You write to me that you're holding your pillow at night, lying in your bunk and imagining it's me you're with, my dearest. And you tell me I should do the same, but it's all in vain. It's nothing like you. And here's a really sad one from a mother, writing out to her husband in the, in the East Indies. I was forced to send our son to sea because I couldn't feed him anymore. And he's still so young. He's only nine years old. Only think how much it hurts me to send him away. I can't bear it. So please help me out of my misery. Please be merciful to me and your child because he's so young. 
So these letters are a treasure trove because they contain information on the emotions of ordinary people, on the life struggles of ordinary people, on what it's like to be separated and miserable or lonely or missing them, worried. The only unusual thing about the Waffen van Horn is that she ran herself aground. You can find these kind of letters in so many of the collections of letters and of, found amongst these captured ships. And this kind of letter is really extraordinary. Because they were never delivered, they were never read by the person intended, they were never lost, never discarded, never destroyed. And we feel, and many researchers feel too, that this is the treasure left for us to discover. Many of these letters are written by people who are semi-literate or they're written by people for them because they're illiterate. They, would not, they wouldn't have survived in, in state archives or you know, stately home archives. They would have just got lost and we have got them now. So let's think a little bit about letter writing. Letter writing and sending letters by, by sea. This is a port of Bordeaux, one of the busiest ports in Europe. And you can see how many ships there are. And you can also see that stuff is being sent out to the ships that, that are not necessarily at the quayside, they're out in the bay. It took weeks to unload and load ships. Um, before the days of containers, it still took weeks to unload and load ships, even in the 1960s. And then people could choose the ship for their letters. If they knew the master of the ship, they could ask him to take it as a personal favor. And sometimes you see letters marked to go by this ship with this master. In other places, you can see they have not even they don't have the apparatus that they have uh, at Bordeaux, and so people would know in advance that it was the ship was there, the ship's in the in the bay. It's going to take a long time to load. They know where it's going to, and they can put their their letters on board it. So this is both cities and islands. These are Caribbean islands. Uh, but in big cities like London as well, you had the option of using the local tavern or coffee house where your letters could be delivered to you and you could actually put your letters for delivery by captains at sea. You don't have to pay for it. It's a service that they offer. So you have to pay to deliver letters on land, but the sea bit is free. And captains would scout for business too by hanging up mail bags for people to deposit their mail in. So this one is R Rulof Barents of the ship called the Friendship, the Friendship, and it says here it's going to Rotterdam. They know that it's in St. Eustatius. They put this bag up in St. Eustatius out in the West Indies. And then again, in wartime, letters with a dangerous nationality. So coming, say, if you're a neutral ship, but you're carrying letters from an enemy colony, you hide them in your cargo or you hide them in your cabin maybe under your bunk, uh, maybe, I mean, have you seen some hidden in a coffee pot, some on a bit of string put behind the panelling in the, in the captain's cabin, some in barrels, some under particular bits of, um, of cargo in the hold. And the idea being that nobody will spot them and you can keep up your neutral nationality. So this is what a, a packet of letters looks like. Can you see this? So quite big, it's quite thick, and it's got three letters tucked inside it. So they're not sending individual, well, some are individual letters, but often you get packets of letters. And they're for onward delivery as well. So the outer letter contains a writing on it, which says, please send these letters on to so-and-so and so-and-so and -so -and -so in Dublin and Galway, and then they're consigned to the, to the ordinary mail. Ireland is particularly well connected with Europe by post, and I have another letter for you. Uh, which was run by Richard Exum, who was a prisoner of war in Bayonne Castle, who's writing to his wife in February 1757. So he's been a prisoner for some time and it's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, she's in Cork and he's writing, so writing from Bayonne to Cork and he sends a letter to Bordeaux to be sent off to Dublin to be sent on to her in Cork. Dear Betty, your remissness in not writing to me since the 22nd of November is a very great crime and a barefaced coldness and is unprecedented in this castle amongst the other prisoners. I can count within this five weeks, 114 letters from the different parts of Ireland came in here and mostly by way of Bordeaux and the ships belonging to Dublin and Waterford under French colours. The Irish are often under French colours. They have a very strong trade with Bordeaux and uh, they don't like to let it go. The post goes out of Cork three times a week and you're not barred from sending by way of Rotterdam either. 
You have your easy bed by night and your warm house, whilst I'm confined, confined within this dark castle where there is nothing but bare walls and a cold floor to lie on. Can't help but feel rather sorry for him. So cargoes tend to follow trade routes. Letters follow the old trade routes. It's If you're trying to send a letter somewhere where ships don't really go, it's a lot more complicated. But these are the main trade routes which are happening at the time. So you've got uh, the French trade route. They're exporting wine, brandy, turpentine, prunes and rosin all across Europe. The Mediterranean trades are olive oil, soap, fruit, wine, camel hair and alum for dyeing. Ireland is really, really a busy exporter and it's exporting things from their pastoral economy. So it's beef and butter, tongues are very popular, tallow, which is fat, animal fat, pork and lots and lots of salmon. It seems like a land of bounty at this time. Um, from the north, from Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Russia, the Baltic, we get iron, timber, wheat, wax, herring and linen. And from Newfoundland, which counts as part of the older trade routes because we've been doing it for since the early 1500s, cod, whale oil and whalebone. Lots of dried fish. Um, the kind of letters you get within these trade routes are you get a lot of merchant letters like this one. Um, 50 letters sent by this elderly gentleman here, the father who's in who's trading in Archangel. He's sending letter to his son, Michiel, who's in Italy, northern Italy. 50 letters of advice of the kinds of things saying you wish to go back to Venice, which is unnecessary. There's not much to gain from the carnival, I think. You can see him in his in his black outfit. I think he's quite quite a sober father and doesn't like his son messing around at the Venice Carnival. So he says and said to tell him to get acquainted with the language, try to practice writing letters. And it's quite clear that many merchants at this time were really multilingual. Uh, they they learn languages very easily. We also get tra traders from the Middle East. Um, so European traders trading in the Middle East and Middle Eastern traders trading in Europe. And this letter, you can hear a young man who's who's um, working in Marseille and he writes to his father. These people have very strange manners. Today, a lady bought 10 lengths of fine Damascus brocade without once asking me to reduce my price. She paid, ordered it to be wrapped and delivered to her home, then simply walked out, leaving her embroidered handkerchief on the counter. So, certainly not Middle Eastern customs. On the middle distance too, we get ships often carrying mail and Tenerife is a surprisingly busy area of, um, I mean, now we see it as a holiday island, but then it was really, really a busy trade crossroads. And so we have a ship called the Franciscus coming from Tenerife, going to Hamburg via Dunkirk. Unfortunately, it goes just as um, France declares war and the letters Dunkirk is France. So any letters found going to Dunkirk are enough to, to proclaim the Franciscus as an, as an enemy ship rather than a neutral ship. Um, so there's loads and loads of people living in Tenerife and these, these 150 letters are some of the most interesting we found, but I've chosen a selection of a few written by one family. These are the Russell family living on Tenerife, lovely, beautiful, bright Tenerife there. So we have Ellen, the mother, her son, Peter, who's the head of the family and takes it very seriously. Another son, Christopher, who's a priest. Thomas, who's been trading in Cadiz, but is now come back. Joseph and Nellie, the little sister. And they're all, they all write letters, two or three letters to uh, two other children at school in France. Andrew at the English College at Dowie and Catherine at the Poor Clares in Dunkirk. So we know these are probably an English um, recusant family living in Tenerife um, to maintain their Catholic religion. But they're very, very clear that they want an English education for their children, but an English Catholic education. Anyway, they have lots of letters. So mother sends Catherine lemons, marmalades and some little sugar sweets, which apparently Tenerife is famous for. Andrew gets a guinea as pocket money. Christopher writes in Latin to test Andrew. Thomas, Joseph and Nellie write letters of good wishes and poor old Nellie's had the smallpox, but she's better now. However, Peter, the pater familiars, tells them both off in quite tough language. So to Catherine, he says, I received your letter by Captain Forrestal in Spanish. It was needless to write to me in that language. No one would believe you were educated with the English ladies if you write in Spanish. My dear sister, let me entreat you to mind your learning with cheerfulness, your music with spirit and your dancing with grace. So it sounds to me as though Catherine's doing reasonably well, apart from wanting to write and speak Spanish. 
but poor Andrew really gets it in the neck. I hope you'll mind your study in writing, ciphering and, and dancing, as this will conduce to your future happiness. Consider what a disappointment it will be to us at your return to find you as ignorant as when you went. Andrew, you cannot plead the want of genius was your misfortune, nor yet good example. What a burning shame will it be to you when you should be reproached that one blockhead came from the seminary, and that was one Andrew Russell. So I think, as you can tell, he takes his, his position as head of the family very, very seriously. Let's move on about a bit now to look at some of the colonial trades. And remember, letters follow these trade routes as well. We get some letters from Africa, slaves, about slaves, gold and elephant's teeth, as they call ivory. We've catalogued them as elephant's teeth because I think it gives a reminder of just how many elephants were killed in this trade. Vast numbers of elephants all across West Africa. In the West Indies, the trades are sugar, coffee, cocoa, indigo and cotton. In the Spanish main, you also get silver, wood, sarsaparilla, which surprised me, but apparently it's a remedy for syphilis, and jollop, which seems to be a remedy for everything. In North America, it's tobacco, rice, cotton, wood pitch. A good, uh, good shipbuilding material there. In the East Indies, again, coffee, rice, sugar, spices and cloth. And China, tea, china and silks. France is busy re-exporting all this to Europe and Ireland is exporting salted food to the Caribbean. And of course, this is what it's all about. It's about the triangle trade between Europe, Africa, the Caribbean islands and back to Europe, plus these other trades, the provisions trade, backwards and forwards, sending goods to, to the Caribbean and receiving all these fantastic, wonderful new colonial commodities back. And the same from North America. They're also sending a lot of cod down to the Caribbean. And here we have uh, the manufactured goods going to Africa, the enslaved Africans going to the Caribbean, to South America, to, North, to the south of North America, and then the raw materials coming back. And it's a, a huge, huge driver of the economy. And one of the ships we have in it is the Abraham of Nantes, a slave ship, a French slave ship, obviously coming from Nantes, which was one of the really big centers of the French slave trade captured coming back from Martinique. So she's gone from Nantes to West Africa, from West Africa to Martinique, and now she's coming back from Martinique. And she spent six months of 1744 buying people into slavery in West Africa. Here at Epe on the Lagos Lagoon. So this is, this is Nigeria. This is the huge lagoon just behind the shore. You can see it's a really beautiful place. Um, it's a chief port for exporting slaves of the Ijebu Ode Kingdom. And what we have extraordinarily is a collection of letters from the Abraham out, out in the bay, sending letters ashore to her officers and men who were out gathering slaves. This one's a bit worm-eaten, but generally they're in quite good condition. And we've got 500 of these sent between the ship and the, sh and the crew on shore buying slaves. It's really, really rare to get this level of detail. Many of the letters are saying, send more brandy, we need brandy. Uh, but they also keep a daily register of the slaves that are brought on board. So on this day, on the 18th of June, 1744, 12 captives were brought on board. Five men, five women, one boy, one girl. And then it notes where each of them is branded and who the buyer is. So this one, Mr. Bartome, is getting two men and two women. And another register tells how much they cost for each person. OK, so for this is for a large man. Uh, two barrels of eau de vie of brandy. Something Indian. I don't know what these terms are. are um, so it would be great to discover what they are. But all these things went to buy this one man. One Holland, one drop of Holland. I think that's a Holland sheet, uh, like a cambric sheet, maybe. So we've got two guns, gunpowder, Bengal handkerchiefs coming from India. It's a, it's quite shocking and interesting to see the the kind of like interconnections of things from across the world going to buy people in West Africa. Um, the ship finally took 375 men off to Martinique. 71 of them died on the voyage, and so did nine of the French crew. Over in the Caribbean, here we are in Havana, 
you can see it's a seat of luxury of, of real high society in some of these colonies. They have vast amounts of, they, the white population has vast amounts of money and they spend it. So there's this huge trade in slaves because they have to keep perpetually being bought over again because they keep dying. They're not looked after properly. Then, you know, even as an investment, they're not looked after properly. Treated very, very badly and not fed well. But lots of provisions are coming in from Europe too. Uh, the sugar, the coffee and the cocoa are going out, but going out with them are vast numbers of letters to Europe and coming back are vast numbers of letters to the West Indies. These were the most valuable colonies the world's ever known. And you can see just how industrial a process it was. Um, the French islands were also a huge market for luxury goods and free blacks here, as you can see them are both traders and customers. Uh, there was quite a lot of intermingling on some of the islands. Um, Annika Rapka, a German historian, has written about what happened, what the colonists put in their letters back home. And she's got a variety of general subjects. One subject is the heat, the tropical storms, the bites of unknown insects, unfamiliar food, falling ill, feeling queasy, feeling feeble, feeling irritated. But they also find difficulty with the makeup of colonial societies as well as the physical physicality of living somewhere so hot. They find the mingling of the white population, regardless of European distinctions of rank, to be very difficult. You can, it's a real frontier place. You can go make your fortune there and it doesn't matter where you've come from as long as you're French, white. You can make your fortune. Some of the, some of the blacks in uh, the West Indies actually become free blacks. And as we can see here, they're trading and consuming. And they cause outrage to French merchants, for example. A French merchant's wife writes back that she's outraged at their impertinence who parade the streets in voguish clothes. And you can see they are wearing very voguish clothes. I don't know if this is particularly a French thing and affects the French islands or if it, it happens in the English and Dutch islands as well. But uh, when war was about to be declared, we have orders for extra provisions to come from France. Annika's written about these. And these are the kind of orders that they're putting in. You'd think it would be something a bit different, but no, they're asking in 1753 for little balls of chocolate in paper, mantillas of all sizes and baubles for the ladies, such as necklaces and four dozen kerchiefs with blue or red stripes on white. So you can see they, um, <laughs> they're not necessarily taking the war effort that seriously. And then this, of course, is all the stuff that comes back and the civility and the civilization that comes with it. Even Bach writes a coffee cantata in celebration of coffee. And you have here not merely the coffee and the sugar and all the wonderful stuff that comes with it, but you have also the porcelain. And the porcelain is coming from the other side of the world where you get really long distance communication. And because it's so difficult to do, you get very large collections of letters in these ships. So the Henriette coming from China and Indonesia and South Africa, coming back home to Emden, she brings with her 1,500 packets of letters. It's absolutely extraordinary. She also gets to within spitting distance of Emden and is captured by a very small naval ship. And the, the um, because war is about to be declared the next day, the, the naval ship knows this and scoops up this poor Henriette who's come from the other side of the world. And here's my last slide. And this is a painting which I saw when I was in Rome at the Barberini Museum. It's described as a Jesuit and his family. And I think it's the most ex one of the most extraordinary paintings I've seen. We have the family desperately proud of their Jesuit son who is in China, preaching to the Chinese. And he has sent back so many wonderful things to his family. I love here we have the desperately serious young son. And here we have the one who is desperately unserious but putting on a very bold face and then we have the younger son here and they're wearing these fantastic outfits which are presumably Chinese but I think it's a very Italian version of Chinese. I wanted to show you this post this um, particular painting because it, it strikes me very much that it shows the kind of like the European idea of different civilizations without actually really understanding the different civilizations at all that they're coming across. And I'm going to use it as an illustration to a fantastic letter that was written by an Italian missionary back to his mother. 
Um, but he's a missionary in India, not in China. And it's the kind of letter which I think every mother would worry about receiving, even though he presents it as good news. Dearest mother, having encountered a favourable occasion of a Dutch ship which is heading towards Europe, I use the opportunity to give you my news. Thanks to the Lord, I am in good and perfect health. Only by accident and by the negligence of the cook, on Friday after the feast of the Corpus Domini, I was intoxicated by copper rust and opium. It's fortunate that I noticed it in time and that I had medicine in my room. I've been recovering for five or more months and I really doubted I would escape death, being reduced to a pure skeleton in a few days. But by the grace of the Lord and the effect of repeated medicine, I have recovered to perfect health. Now I wait to learn the necessary languages for my ministry. I already know French and Portuguese and I have begun to sermonize in Portuguese. I understand and speak some Hindi, but I'm not fluent, it being a very difficult language to write and to pronounce. Other things about the customs and way of life I will not write, since they would be believed to be fables. It may be enough for you to know I am well, and if God will grant me life and health, after my prescribed here term here, I will return to Europe. And one rather gets the impression that he can't wait, and I'm sure his mother would actually be longing to have him back. So... I just want to say that this is the, going to be the Prize Papers website. It's called Prize Papers Portal. Um, the first batch of records were being put up, as I say, by Oldenburg in October or November. We are starting not with the letters, but with a collection of printed material from the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it's appeals. It's, everything's been translated into English. They're easy to read. And we felt that this would be a very good starter to introduce the concept of prize, of the prize courts, of the trades and of the letters to people without the barrier of difficult writing and multiple languages. And they're absolutely fascinating. And that is where we're waiting for the prize papers portal to be online in probably about eight or nine weeks time and i just end there and hope there's some questions amanda thank you very much that was absolutely fascinating i'm actually i'm quite surprised you mentioned that we were first involved back in 2013. it's a long time ago isn't it i can't, I can't believe that <laughs> <laughs> an awful lot has happened since then and, yes. And it's all been very positive. We, yes. We've got some questions rolling in, but but I was going to start by asking you about, of all the papers that have been collected and gathered together, how many languages are involved? Because it's not just French and Dutch. And I assume we also had no. recaptured some of our papers that yes. were captured as well. That's so, right. Shall I, shall I stop sharing my screen? Would that be helpful? Yes. OK. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. Good. OK, here yeah. I am back again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many languages? Well, at the moment, it's, it's 19 and counting. <laughs> 19. Right. 19 yeah. and counting. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of material in English because all the court papers are in English and all the examinations of the captured crew are in English. Sure. And when we get to the American War of Independence, we're carrying English speaking ships. Um, and the Irish, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of that light behind me. The Irish quite often carry on trading and are suspected of trading with the enemy. So we get a lot of Irish letters as well written in English. Yeah. Um, but the other languages are French, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, Dutch, German, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian. Uh, we have had um armenian quite a lot of armenian surprisingly some bengali some hindi um arabic yes. uh the most interest the most fascinating one i think actually is basque we get not oh. very many basque letters oh. but basque let letters written in the basque language are very rare um which is oh. is quite unusual but we get a lot of them we've had we've had probably found about 150 of them so far maybe yeah. and it's it's completely un, it was completely unknown to Basque scholars that people actually wrote in Basque they thought oh. they just spoke it yes. but we found we found these letters and they do write in Basque oh. so it's what a variation on Spanish or 
crossing no complete completely thing. different language no completely, completely different, different. Oh. a unique language it's one yeah. of these languages which doesn't exist anywhere else isn't related to any other language yeah. and so Basque scholars are thrilled with us yes i'm sure so, yes yeah. yeah okay well whilst we've been talking then we've had some questions roll in uh, from uh brian smith i noticed as trade routes that no wine and spirits were shown was this trade not happening in the period well, it certainly were. I thought they were on the French one. The French French trade is full of wine and spirits. Right. And certainly we get a lot of rum coming from the West Indies as well, or yeah. actually coming down yeah. from America. Yeah. It's, it's quite odd. The molasses seem to go up to America, to you know, to what became the United States, and then it comes back as rum. Yeah. But there's, there's definitely a very, very strong wine trade, and I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Um, I I can't imagine that there wouldn't be. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, uh, right, it's just moving down. Brian's wants asking about the Revolutionary War archives. Uh, the American ones or the French ones? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the Revolutionary War archives. Brian, Brian Swan, if you could perhaps elaborate, and we'll move down to a question from Elaine. What was the justification given by the government for the capture of uh, ships? In British um, and elsewhere? Uh, it was economic warfare, basically. They have a theory at the time that there's only a limited amount of wealth. And if you take it from your enemy, then they've lost it and you've got it. And right. they've, it's um, so. But really, they're, they're trying to damage enemy trade as much as possible. Right. So, uh, yes, you said, do we have English English ships taken and then recaptured. Yes, we do. Quite a lot yes. of English ships. Yes. And certainly, I think equivalent numbers of, of English ships were captured by our enemies. Yes. And when, if we're lucky, we, we, take, we take them back again. Mm. Um, yes. And if we're very lucky, they still got their letters on them. But it's normal for a captor to take off all the paperwork immediately. Yes. And then send the So all the paperwork goes on to the capturing ship. And they send a small prize crew in with the captured ship to the nearest port. Yes, but yes. Um, you know it was it was a standard part of warfare. I mentioned um, Patrick O'Brien in my in my blurb when I when I put together something about what I was going to be talking about. Yes, so certainly Patrick O'Brien makes it clear that privateers snap up trade as much as possible. Oh, uh, sure. The navy yeah. does it too, but it's rather yes. frowned upon, and they're they're yes. not supposed to put their own pocket before the national interest. <laughs> but it, so they're supposed to destroy rather than capture. Right. Because they can they can destroy more on a cruise because they don't have they don't lose their um, seamen to take the ships into port. Yes, for but, sure. Uh, so, what, what sort of proportion of the mail was left unopened? It's difficult to tell because we haven't we haven't been through it all as yet. Um, I think in general, they open enough mail to prove to absolutely prove that it's either a, an enemy ship, which is quite easy. Yeah. or a neutral ship carrying out enemy trade right. and that's more difficult sure. uh yeah for th if, uh, the sh if the neutral if the neutral ships prove to be a neutral they get all their papers back again so we don't have them but right. what we do have is translations made for the court so you have like a ghost archive of translations of letters that we don't have any longer yeah. so would the papers not have been a, a useful source of intelligence you would think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. I would definitely but, think so, but they don't seem to use it as such. It wasn't used as such, because... Yeah, yeah. Even, even, even when we capture signals, they tend not to use it as such. There yeah. was one, I can't remember exactly when it was, but uh, we captured French signals for, for use in the Mid-Atlantic, yeah. and uh, the captor, who was a naval captain, kept them for a while, sent all the other papers in, um, and he was reprimanded by the court for not sending the the signals in as well and he said well i'm using to plan attacks but no, it wasn't good enough <laughs> <laughs> this used to be not very joined up <laughs> oh dear right it, it does sound as if they missed a trick there because oh, uh, yeah. they've been a fascinating resource if only for economic intelligence as to what the yes. trade, the extent yeah. of trade was that was going on absolutely yeah okay um uh, let's just looking down the list again are there any letters from sailors or just colonists no, there are letters from sailors and they're absolutely fascinating. Mm. Quite often we, we get two kinds of letters from sailors. One is where if we, if we have a ship that's captured and then is recaptured, 
by its original nation. Yeah. Quite often we find that the captors took the opportunity of sending in letters to their home port with their with the prize crew that's taking it in. Right. Um, we've had two of these recently, the John and Constant in the 1740s. It was a ship coming up from Italy laden with marble for Dublin mm. and it was taken by two French warships and the French warships took the opportunity to let their men write letters and uh, put them in the John and Constant and send them off home to Brest. And so everybody wrote letters and we were a bit confused at first because several of them were in the same hand to different women. They say, yeah. my dear wife in exactly the same hand. And then we realized, no, they were written for people, <laughs> not by people. <laughs> and, then, and then the John and Constant was snapped up by an English ship on its way home to Brest. So yeah. on its way back to Brest. Yeah. And we had another one recently of an American, uh, American ship capturing something mid-Atlantic and again, putting lots of letters home to Newburyport this time, saying it's our first capture, cap, it's our first capture, isn't it wonderful? And then again, it was snapped up and taken into New York. So, and New York obviously was British at the time. Yes. So. Okay. Um, let's come back. Brian has clarified the question earlier about the Revolutionary War archives, and he said yes. six to eighty-one. Any information on captured papers from America or France? Uh, yes, we're working on it at the moment. Um, we're, we're dividing this into two. We're, we're doing, uh, we're doing a brief descriptions of the captures, first of all, in HCA 32. And so far we've described ships whose names begin with A to G, uh, uh searchable in the catalogue. Uh -huh. Um, we are not doing full descriptions of those because the reason we're doing them is because most of the letters, not all of the letters, but most of the big collections of letters were taken off and stored separately in the Tower of London and at some point they look as though they fell off the shelf, got stirred up with a great big stick, put back into separate sacks, but you know, just bundled into whatever sack happened to be there. Mm -hmm. When they got to the to the old public record office they were put in boxes as they came. And yeah. now we've got a project which is funded by an American funder to try and resort all those letters back into their original ships. And we need the details of the ship captures in order to help us identify them. Yes. But we hope that's a three-year project and it will be fantastic once it's done. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, there's, I mean, it's, yes. it's more than, it's more than American letters in there, of course. Loads, loads, you know, it's For more sure. French and Dutch yes. than American, but yes. the American ones are wonderful. Yes. And uh, do we have examples of coded messages? Well, I've seen a coded message that's in the, um, it's in the appeals. It's some. It's an appeal from the 1750s, the printed appeals, mm -hmm. and it prints a letter which says, "It's a young man writing back from the West Indies to Hamburg, I think." He says, "If I say the weather is good, it means the price of coffee is high. If the weather is rainy, the price of coffee is going down." <laughs> and it makes you wonder, looking at all these other letters which talk yes. about the weather, what yes. do they mean? <laughs> what do yes. they mean? All oh, right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's that's the kind of code which is is not a, a spy code. It's a mercantile code to you know protect his trade secrets or uh, yes yes or, yeah, sure. yes rig the market maybe yes um, right where where have we got to A to G is that the name of the captured ship or the captor? It's the captured ship. Everything's done by the captured ship. ship. We are we are adding the name of the captor. So this is opening up a whole new research area of Royal Navy captures, not of warships, but of, of trade yeah. and merchant ships. And yeah. of course, the privateer stuff as well, yeah. because that was that was never included before. So. Mm -hmm. And the more privateers deployed, the more ships your enemy must use for convoy protection. Absolutely, so, yes. Yeah. But but did they do they tend to go in convoy or were they sort of Well, separate? some some do. They do the French certainly have convoys. Uh, they're yeah. not always very effective. Yeah. You get a couple of battles in the 1740s, uh, Cape two battles off Cape Finisterre which which disrupt very large convoys and capture lots of ships. Yes. But uh, yeah. they do try. Mm. Yes, yeah. obviously protection in number obviously. Helps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you find that the lists of prize money distribution in the London Gazette helps to sort mail? Um, we have used it. We used it in lockdown to try and identify, get a, get a little bit further forward this American war sort. Um, it doesn't identify mail, but it does identify uh, captors. 
and dates of capture. But unfortunately, it wasn't as helpful as it might have been. Lloyd's list is a bit more helpful. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, in lockdown, we also catalogued the um, the papers of the of the prize papers for the uh, Crimean War, and we were able to do that because one of our volunteers had had crunched the data in an index beforehand, oh. mm -hmm. and I was able to use. Uh, the London Gazette for that, which was really helpful at that oh. period of time, yeah. and also an excellent, a really excellent website on the mid-Victorian Navy. And we were able to pull together information from different places to really flesh out this index. Mm -hmm. And it was it was good stuff. Yeah. But I don't know if there's any letters in there because this was all done off-site and we haven't had a time to look at them yet. I know, sure, sure. Yes, it's been, been a bit uh, odd this last sort of 18 months mm. or so. Um, um, we've got any questions here? Um, these rebel American privateers were actually employed to escort convoys. That wouldn't surprise me, certainly, mm -hmm. because a lot of the privateers are, are heavily armed merchant merchantmen. Yes. Um, we have, as I say, we've only done A to G so far, so we haven't really no. got enough to, to pull out patterns we're very fortunate at the um we also have normally we only have the records of the high court of admiralty in london but for this war because we were occupying new york we had a, a vice admiralty court there and uh when we evacuated new york we brought all the records with us so for this war and only this war we've got a really wonderful set of data about uh, trade up and down the american coast and down to the west indies and it's absolutely amazing. And the Americans didn't know we had it. So it's wonderful you know, for, for us. It's a really fantastic piece yes. of, um, of extra yes. information. Yes, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. And I suppose in time, you'll be able to work out who were the most successful of the crews, whether it's the Royal Navy or whether it were privateers. In, in yes. This yeah. particular I, type yes. of high seas activity. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. It's a... Okay, um, I think just... why don't funding bodies in the UK fund projects that will take 20 years to complete? <laughs> oh, I wish they did. I really <laughs> wish they did. <laughs> it's quite interesting that the funding body is, is, uh, the, is one of the German academies, like we have the British Academy. Yes. Our British Academy was founded in the early 1900s, I believe. The German academies were founded in the 1700s, um, and this particular oh, one was, found, yeah. was founded by, I believe, George the First. So he founded right. one in his Hanoverian yes. domains, but didn't find one in in Britain. Yes. So. yes, yes, and of course, it's not just prize papers here; it's prize papers abroad in Holland and elsewhere. Yes, there, there will be, yeah. But as I say, as far as we know, we're the only ones, um, the English Admiralty System and the colonial courts that went with it are the only ones that kept the letters. So yeah. we have some letters which came from the New York court. Yeah. We know that a few um, that went into Halifax and Nova Scotia uh, for, late, for the Napoleonic Wars are now in the National Archives of Canada. Yes. But other archives don't seem to have the letters. Right. They have details about the ships and the cargoes, but not sure. not this extra mail that's carried on the ships. Yes, fascinating. Well, Amanda, thank you very much. This has uh, been a fascinating summary of all the work that's gone on. I'm so pleased that the friends are there with you, supporting well, in yeah. various ways. And there's been some com comments here about can we have a another podcast or a seminar or something or another summary or, or an update and I think that's an, an absolute must because I'm sure there will be not only well I do know there's another article coming in Magna soon about uh, prize papers activities um, and there probably will be some more projects we fund along the way as well but I think it'd be good to to keep up to speed with you to see how progress is going and sort of come back at some point next year yeah, we'd place. love that. Yeah. We'd love that. If you like, we could talk about the captures because some of them are very exciting and some of them are absolutely, you know, you think, how can they be so dumb? But yeah. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was one French crew which got taken into Guernsey. They they yeah. they were nervous. They were a prize crew, but they, they weren't expert sailors. And so they took one of the captured crew 
yeah. and gave him the helm and he took them to Guernsey Guernsey. and told them <laughs> told them they were going to Bordeaux <laughs> and they believed him <laughs> as you do yeah. um, dear, 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 dear. yes that's uh, yeah anyway yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure it's always Thank a pleasure you. to have anything yes. to do with the friends and we yes. are really grateful for your support in the past yes because on the previous pro long project we worked on on chancery you supported us all the way through that and that was a 15 year project and then uh, now again on this one so if you want to make a quick shout out about volunteers we spoke about the other well at, yes at some point we are looking for some volunteers to work on the american war captures we're not quite there yet um i'd hope to be there by today to announce it properly but yeah. We will we will let you know when it is, but we want to make sure that we've got all the all the stuff in place, all the right instructions in place, yeah, sure. and uh, everything ready so that we don't keep people hanging on a string. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can get something into the November magazine and get something yeah. on the website as and when you're ready. That would that uh, would be great. Yes. So yeah. a a very big thank you from me, Amanda. It's been nice to see you again. It's been ages since we last had a chance to to chat. So, yeah, it hasn't it just. Okay. Uh, oh, hang on, something just snuck in here. You may find the capture and recapture of the mediator in June 1745, a good laugh. All right, okay. So the mediator, what... okay, I'll look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, June 1745. Okay. There we go. Um, and th thank you very much. On behalf of everybody, I won't ask everyone to unmute and give a round of applause, but you can <laughs> us that it's been very interesting and we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. It's been a great like pleasure. Hang on and, until the yeah. end. And then we're, we're. I'm just going to read the messages since I've not had a chance to see them yet. Yes, okay.